Are you experiencing a friendship recession? The term was coined in 2021 by the American Survey Center to describe this really alarming phenomenon that shows that many adults have completely lost their close friendships or they don't have any. Today, we're going to talk to our very special guest, one of our favorite guests, Florence Ann Romano. She is coming back to the show to talk about her brand new book that's called Build Your Village, A Guide to Finding Joy and Community in Every Stage of Life. It just came out in February of 2023, and it provides these wonderful strategies of how to build healthy, supportive, what she calls villages around us and the, the points that we really need to know to do that. So join me today. This is going to be an amazing episode, and I think you'll get a lot out of it. It's going to be awesome. Welcome to Florence and Romano. Hello, this is Mary Jo Timlin from Teaching Your Toddler, and today we are so happy to welcome back Florence Ann Romano to the show, uh, our frequent guest, and we're so happy to have her again. Welcome to the show. Thanks for talking to us today. I'm so happy to be back with you. It's always like yeah. visiting a friend when I'm Aww. with you, so I'm always so thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Well, today I love our topic because unfortunately we have to talk about this. It's, a, it's an unfortunate topic to talk about, but it's fantastic, and that is sort of making these connections in our in our village, what you call your village, right? Um, and I want to talk about that. So I, I know it, it ties into your book. So we'll talk about how to make that connection and those types of villagers and all those kinds of things. And then we'll we'll talk about your book, of course, too. Um, so what what is a support system or what is your village? Can you tell us what that means first? Well, you know, I'm, the moms listening out here, you know, I always laugh because I think the one thing I hear the most is bemoaning the fact, you know, where is this village that people talk about? Is there a number to call? Do they just show up at your door? Is there a roadmap <laughs> for it? You know, what is this village? You know, you hear that proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. And we all agree that that's true. But the villages look different. The communities look different. And beyond that, it isn't just something that's isolated to parents. Mm -hmm. People who don't have children also deserve to find their people. They deserve Mm -hmm. to have a support system. Mm -hmm. And it was really during COVID that I started looking around and thought to myself, gosh, on a global level, we all know what it feels like to lose our support systems. How often does that happen, Mary Jo? We all know on a global level what something feels like. Mm-hmm. So it often. was really, right? It was yeah. a really collective experience. Um, but after COVID kind of started to subside and everyone had to get back to socializing, had to get back to connecting, there seemed to be a disconnect from the connection. People were, you know, uh, uh, you know, absolutely distraught over the fact that they couldn't have their support systems when they were ripped away from them. But then when it was time to get them back, it seemed very difficult for people mm-hmm. to do that. And not only did they not know how to do it, it was almost like they needed to be taught all of those skills all over again, but they didn't necessarily want to do it either. Mm. And, and so isn't it weird how fast we forgot that? Like yeah, after living it? our whole lives like that, and then suddenly right. we forgot after just whatever it was, 18 months or whatever. Yeah. Right. And, and it got me thinking about this, this concept of village. And if we all are out there wanting someone to help give us a roadmap to it, then how does that roadmap work for you. And the Mm -hmm. best way for, at least in my mind, I thought to be able to, uh, to kind of illustrate that skill was through six archetypes of villagers Mm -hmm. that you identify with. Who am I as a villager? And then who am I looking for in my village of these six? Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's a lot of honesty, a lot of vulnerability that goes into that work, but that's what actually starts to build that support system. Oh, fantastic. Can you, I I don't want to give away all your secret sauce from your book, but can you tell us about those archetypes a little bit? Sure. So the six are accepting, dependable, cheerleader, communicator, organizer, and healer. Now I know when I just go through a list like that, you're like, wait a second, define each of those. I'll go through them a little bit, but I always like to give that list of six first, because it's always so funny to me how people, as soon as I start saying those words, they start casting in their head who they think the people are in their lives that fit into those roles, which is exactly what I want you to do. Mm -hmm. It is like casting a movie or casting Mm -hmm. a play. These are your main characters. Mm -hmm. And without me giving a definition to any of them, I bet you're already starting to get a sense of, you know, who those people are and what you think the definition might be. But let's start, I'll give you a couple examples maybe of the six major. Let's start with the dependable one. 
are, and you know what? Actually, I'm going to change mine. Then. Let's go with accepting. Accepting is the first one I mentioned. Accepting villager is usually the first person I say you cast in the village because that's the one who doesn't judge you. It's the mm. non-judgmental one. It's mm-hmm. the one you're going to go to, to confide in, you know, to tell your deepest, darkest secrets to. Um, and that's a pretty important person in your life. And then let's look at the last one that I talked about, the healer. The healer, I like to say, is not the person that's going to come in there and fix you or fix your situation, but they're going to walk with you through it. Mm. They're going to be your North Star. Mm. Uh, And that is a very important lesson. I think we all need to learn about relationships in our life. We can never expect that anyone is going to fix our problems or fix us, Mm -hmm. but having the support through something, that's the difference maker. That's what gets you through it. That's sometimes also to um, what helps you find decisions because you have that Mm -hmm. support, find solutions rather. Um, So those are a couple examples of of those villagers. And the other thing I want to mention too, is as you're doing this work, and figuring out who these people are in your lives. One of the things people say to me all the time is, gosh, I don't think I have any of these people. Well, you probably do. There Mm -hmm. probably are people that are in your life that are fulfilling a certain role, but here's the secret. They might not be sitting in the right seat. Mm -hmm. You may have cast some of these people in the wrong roles. Maybe your organizer villager, for example, this is the one that you delegate to. This is the one, if you think if you have a stove and it's it's a bunch of pots on the stove and the water is starting to boil, that Mm -hmm. person's not going to let the water boil over. That person's going to put a lid on the pot. That's Mm -hmm. the person that kind of can temper the situation. Mm -hmm. It's kind of your reasonable thinker. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe you're putting a friend in that position when they're really not the organizer at all. They can't, you can't delegate tasks to them. And yet you're doing this to them. You're putting this burden on them. You're putting this expectation on them, but they're failing you. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because you're not playing to their strengths. Maybe they're more the accepting villager or the dependable villager, whatever they might be. Mm -hmm. Um, And so making sure that you have the right people in the right seats is equally as important as doing this work and finding those people too. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah. Because then you start to get annoyed and you think, well, why isn't that person helping me? And it's because that's not their strength or that's not their spot, right? Right, right. Exactly. And can you have, I mean, you know, they say a village, like, does it literally have to be the people in your community? Or can there be people that are across the country or elsewhere? Yeah, I think that that's the wonderful thing about our world today in terms of technology and something we certainly used during COVID was the the virtual village. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, look at me, look at you, you know, we are virtual villages to a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And, and that's a wonderful way to, to grow, um, to have new experiences, to uh, have friends from all different cultures, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's important to to do that work too, in a virtual way, or, uh, you know, a, a, a geographically um, different sort of Mm -hmm. way, whatever Mm -hmm. it might be. Um, But As you start to think about these villagers or you think about the people in your life, to your point, is it just people that live nearby you? No, it's not just people that live nearby you. And it's also not people that are necessarily going to be with you for the long haul. Hmm. There's your primary villages and your secondary villages. Your Mm -hmm. primary villages might be your family and your best friends. Mm -hmm. But then your secondary villages, perhaps those are people that come and go as circumstances arise. Think of, you know, in your community, when you hear about a family that has had a tragedy, a Mm -hmm. death in the family, or has lost a job or fallen on hard times or whatever it might be. And you're part of the meal train that's Mm -hmm. set up. Mm-hmm. And you're part of that person's secondary village during those moments of crisis, during mm-hmm. that healing for that family. Yeah. It doesn't make that position that you hold for that temporary amount of time less valuable because it is temporary. Um, but it's also accepting the fact that the roles that we take on in life in people's villages are not always meant to be for a lifetime. You know, life, they say, happens for a reason, a season, a mm. lifetime friendships. Mm -hmm. And all of this falls into that category too. And I think also 
taking that pressure off of ourselves to think that if we're not in it for the long haul with people, then that's not a fruitful relationship or it's not productive or worth our time. Right. Um, I've had relationships with people, whether they're romantic or they're friendships where there's a falling out or they're just kind of, it kind of fizzles away. Mm -hmm. There's a chapter in my book about when the village burns down, when the village is lost. Mm. Sometimes you burn it down yourself. Mm. Sometimes it burns down for reasons, you know, out of your control. Mm -hmm. Um, but the rebuilding of it, that's Um, where we have to come into play. That's really intriguing. And it kind of, I know that you also, maybe you address when you move somewhere, like if you relocate or something like I, I recently came back from Colorado to my hometown, but my son and my husband, they've never lived here. And so, you know, that that's, I have some, a little bit of a village from before, but you know, they have nothing. So how do you do that when you move? Moving is a big thing, actually, that I talk about in the book, too. One of my best girlfriends moved to Texas a couple years ago, even a little less than that. And she called me and she's like, how am I supposed to do this? I don't know a single person in Houston. (laughs) I know nothing about the culture of Texas. You know, we're Chicago, born and raised Midwestern Mm -hmm. girls. And she really did not know a soul. And Mm -hmm. it was a struggle with a husband who traveled a lot for work, two young kids. um, And she really had to put herself out there, you know, Mm -hmm. and we talked a lot about it. And one thing I suggested to her, now I moved back to my hometown too, Mary Jo, but now I lived here my whole life, lived in the city for 13 years and then moved back here. And I still do have quite, quite a village, uh, you know, in my, in my hometown. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, I was new to my block. I was Mm -hmm. new. You know, mm-hmm. you know, to, and all these people had families, all these people had children. I'm not married. I don't have children. I felt like the outsider, like who wants the single girl living on the block? I don't think right. anyone. So what I did actually was put together little gift baskets, did not cost a lot of money at all. I put a card in it that had a note for me, my name, my phone number, my email address and where I lived. Mm-hmm. And it was so nice because all of the neighbors then came and dropped by and met me Aww. and said hello and thanked me for the gift basket and all that. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden I had, you know, 14 new friends, you mm-hmm. know, from like all around here. Mm-hmm. And we have a very tight kind of block and community that I'm a part of that they've taken me into. But I realized in that moment for myself where I didn't really know what to do or how to really connect back with people or how to be a good neighbor necessarily. I lived in an apartment building for so long. What was this kind of house life, you know, for me? Um, That was my way of of trying to connect with people. And they reached back. And I'm very Mm -hmm. grateful that they did. But it took putting myself out there in some sort Mm -hmm. of way of putting some effort in in order Mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. So that's my message there, too, is if you want it to be different, if you want to connect with people, then, you know, maybe volunteer somewhere in the community, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's a nice way of meeting people that are like minded um, Mm -hmm. and have similar values to you. Um, But maybe it is, you know, knocking on the doors of your neighbors and putting together a little open house or something like that so you can meet people. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, I've had that thought like in my new neighborhood, again, I live very far South from where I grew up. And so, yeah, I don't know anyone really either. And, um, it's, it's so weird that I can't like text my neighbor when we're out of town and say, Hey, did the house burn down or whatever? Like I don't know anybody and that's my fault, but I mean, I love that idea. So I I think that those are great. Um, and I, and I know you're sort of talking about that give and take of like, you, you do have to sort of Right. Put yourself out there. Right. And and make that effort um, because they're not just going to come over again. People are so like you said, from COVID, even people are just so scared and, and they're not. I mean, I know our next door neighbor is still masking. So I'm kind of assuming like I'm not sure if I would go talk to them. Right. Because I don't right. know if they would be comfortable with me coming over there. Right. So right. I don't know. It's we're all in kind of weird places still. Right. And you, and you're accepting where people are. That's part of it too. You know, yep. what people's boundaries are, their comfort level, but that's why if you drop a note at the door and you give your information, then at least it's someone that could text you and let you know if your house is burning down, <laughs> even if they don't want to have a social relationship <laughs> with you. And believe me, there are some of those people that even without me dropping a note at someone's door, a neighbor was going to come to my house and introduce themselves. And they were just that type of people. Aww. But you know, this, this work that we're talking about, the connecting with people, it's not necessarily a reflex or a natural to everyone. Mm. You know, I'm not really a wallflower. So you can kind of drop me in any social, social, social situation and I'll be okay. Right. I understand that for people that weren't uh, mm-hmm. already very animated or inclined to be very social from the jump when they went through COVID and got to retreat, they got to kind of be that turtle in the shell. Mm-hmm. 
it kind of was a little bit even more difficult to come out of that shell after all of that mm-hmm. because you had an excuse mm-hmm. why you didn't have to socialize, why the yoga pants and Netflix was way more interesting than connecting with people. Right. Um, so it does take effort, like anything in life. And I always say that, like, here's the book, here are the here's the roadmap, the way I see it, you know, in terms of village for connecting to people. I can give you the directions, but you mm-hmm. have to get in the car and drive there. Mm-hmm. I can't yeah. make you do that. And just like anything in life, until you want it to change, it won't. Mm-hmm. You have to be the you have to be ready to make the change. Mm-hmm. You have to be willing to put in the work. Yeah. And I know, especially for moms, because so many little kids. Right. Like that's their whole life. That right. COVID was their whole life. And so being right. a mask was their whole life. And so having mom go out there and talk to people and actually connect and that kind of thing is really good role playing as well for them to see it's safe. It's okay. Right. Like, and, and I don't know if you have any thoughts or tips or whatever, but you know, moms go to the park, they go to the, um, the play places, they go to, you know, maybe art class with it for their child or whatever. How can they sort of like I mean, besides just starting to talk to somebody, what, what can, what else can you do? Well, yeah. Putting yourself out there and just starting to talk to someone, you know, that, that, that's sometimes hard, sometimes easy, depending on the person. Um, But one thing I think that's interesting too, when you're trying to figure out where you fit in and my friend who moved to Texas, this is, this is something she had to do too. As she signed her kids up for different things, she, again, not a wallflower was, you know, you know, walking up to people and chatting. Um, But generally I think going in with a question Mm. is the best thing. And this is an easy icebreaker for you. For Megan, my friend who moved, I suggested to her, you know, you're new to the neighborhood, tell them that, but then also ask for their opinion Mm. on maybe where you should get involved, the ages of of their children, um, when they moved here, you know, how was it for them for their transition? Were they born and raised in Texas? All that people tend to to put their guard down when you talk to them about their life, Mm -hmm. not deep, deep, dark secrets, but when you ask them about your, their children or, you know, that's a soft spot for them. Go in with a couple of those questions ready because people generally most of the time want to help. They Mm -hmm. want to share. And if they're thinking that they can be helpful to you in that moment, Mm -hmm. then they're going to feel like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm able to give back in some way. I'm able to be effective right Mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. Um, And then hopefully you start to have a more more meatier or deeper conversation there. Or maybe you exchange phone numbers and they're like, hey, if you ever have any questions, you know, or if you need anything at all, I'm here, you know, let me know. We can get the Mm -hmm. kids together, whatever it is. But that's a very, it sounds very small, but going in prepared with a couple of things to ask might help you feel like you have more control in a situation that feels kind of awkward. A hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, I love that idea. I know we just recently found out talking to my son's um, girlfriend's parents, just talking about like things and, you know, organically it came out like this great place to buy um, meat products that are, uh-huh. natu- you know, natural, they're, yeah. they're local and all these things. I mean, I wouldn't, I would never have known where that place was. I would have not found it on my own, even though it's like literally right down the street. <laughs> but I, you know, I just like that. Those were the kinds of exchanges. And then we started talking about like they were from Wisconsin and, and, and she actually told me about what I'd never heard of as a Midwestern goodbye. You probably appreciate this when you're trying to say goodbye to someone and you just keep talking and then you oh, start, yeah. start talking about something else. And I know exactly what that Midwestern goodbye is. That's why Midwesterners have to learn to do the Irish goodbye, which yes, is just exactly. leap and just disappear. Yes. <laughs> I, don't I know just how recently that. heard that term. I had never yeah. known what that was. My husband is the master of that. Absolutely. I got to go to the bathroom. See ya. I mean, he's gone. Yeah, I appreciate that because I don't know how to do that. I mean, and I'm also Italian, so it is even worse. It's a tour, you know, it's, you've got to go and you're kissing everyone a thousand times. And it's like, oh my gosh, my uncle used to say we needed lips on a stick to just go around and just to, <laughs> do this to people. And I was like, you know that's what? Hilarious. That's smart. And you can, you tell he wasn't Italian. Sorry. He's not Italian. I he didn't want to do that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's good. Oh my gosh. Well, gosh, these are, these are great, great ideas. What else, um, what else do we need to know about, um, about your book or about the, you know, this topic, what, what else can we tell people? You know, this work, like I said, is a lot of honesty and a lot of vulnerability. And and I know that's not always a comfortable place to go. Uh, But I also have been a person who's read those self-help books or those personal growth books. And you're like, I'm not going to do any of this. Mm -hmm. This is all way too hard. This is a heavy lift. I don't have time for it. I did not want to write a book like that. I Mm -hmm. wanted to write 
write a book that felt doable, that mm-hmm. you could wrap your arms around it, run your fingers through it. And also evergreen in nature, mm-hmm. where wherever you are in your life, whether you are 15 or you are 80, mm-hmm. that you have a place you can come home to. And this mm-hmm. book can be that anchor for you. Mm-hmm. Because I think in life, we feel like when things are out of control or we've mm-hmm. lost control or overwhelmed, There always is, I always say, a place to take control in your life. And we've talked about that here too together, Mary Jo. And I feel Mm -hmm. like this is that place you can go to. Mm -hmm. You can go here and come back to this work and say, all right, I'm feeling isolated. I'm Mm -hmm. having some, you know, mental health or well-being struggles. Mm -hmm. And how am I going to get myself out of that? How Mm -hmm. am I going to find the light? And this is a book I hope that does that for you, that you know that the work never has to be done, Mm -hmm. that there's always a place that you can take that control. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to realize too, like I said before, that our relationships in our lives are going to evolve. They are going to change. And this book is supposed to be able to be kind of a companion to you as Mm -hmm. you do that changing. Uh, And so never feel like, There isn't a place that you can go to find that connection Mm -hmm. because it does exist and the the power is within you. And I don't expect anyone out there to have all the ideas on how to solve it. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, you listen to podcasts or you read books or you do things like that. So you can gain that knowledge from Mm -hmm. other people experience. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you are suffering from any of those things, those feelings of isolation, you know, emotional well-being, mental health. I mean, we have a mental health crisis in our country right now. There's a reason that's going on. They said that there's a friendship recession going Mm -hmm. on right now. All of that is true. Mm -hmm. This does not mean the book is to replace therapy or counseling or any sort of Mm -hmm. professional help, but it can be another support piece for Mm -hmm. you. That's fantastic. So, of course, we'll link to it in the show notes. But since we're on video and audio, can you tell us the name and show us? Do you have the book right there? Can you I show us? Wait, you don't mind me like standing up for a oh, second? Oh, no, of course not. Okay, here it is. Woo! Here is Build Your Village. Build Your Village. Uh, Build your village. So yeah, that when I was designing the cover, I mm-hmm. wanted this kind of tree of life concept mm-hmm. and also, you know, the support with the hands and all of that. So mm-hmm. people have asked me like, why did I end up choosing it? But you also see there's gold leaves on oh, yeah. it. So they're all little hearts. Um, mm-hmm. But the the subtitle, it is a guide to finding joy and community in every stage of life. Um, and so, and, and you'll find out about all the six villagers in here and a lot of stories too um, mm-hmm. about my personal life um, and different struggles that I've had and triumphs and mm-hmm. and all the in between and the icky stuff as well. Mm-hmm. And I also do something in the book, not to give a to give away all of it. Like here, there's an example of the organizer village mm-hmm. and the villager. And then you'll get the definition of it, a quote, and then an examples. But I also at the end of each chapter, this is what was important to me too. I always felt like you'd read these books and you're like, how do I actually implement any mm-hmm. of this stuff? So I have gut checks and action steps. The gut checks are what did I learn from mm-hmm. this? from this chapter. And then the action steps are what are things I can do today to actually put this into action? And they're Mm -hmm. easy, they're doable. Again, wrap your arms around it, run your fingers through it. Um, Again, I I don't want it to feel like it's such a heavy lift where it's like, oh gosh, it's going to take me a year before Mm -hmm. I'm actually able to implement any of this. No, the whole point is that it's snackable. It's Mm -hmm. stuff that you can do now. That is awesome. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you again. We'll put it in the show notes. Uh, where do people want, can they get it from your website or do you want yes. to? Yeah. Yes. Anywhere books are sold. You can go okay. visit me on my website, florenceann.com. Follow me on social media, Florence Ann Romano. Um, I am your virtual village. I do answer every DM that I get. Oh. Um, and so please never hesitate. This work is not meant to be done alone. Um, and I really like to be a part of your journey as, as you go through it. Well, that is a perfect way to wrap up again. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. What a great, what a great time to talk to you about all of this, the friendship recession and how we can, how we can solve for that. So thank you again. Thank you. So good to see you. (laughs) You too. Bye-bye. This has been the Teaching Your Toddler podcast with Mary Jo Tinlin. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you'll find us on our website at teachingyourtoddler.com as well as on Facebook at Teaching Your Toddler on Instagram and on Twitter at Teaching Toddler. So join us again, and I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you so much.